What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And today's video is a breakdown of Brees Hall's year one outlook. What can we expect from him in fantasy football as a rookie in 2022? Let's do it. When I'm thinking about where running backs will fall as far as productivity goes in a given season really comes down to the convergence of a few things. Number one is talent. We want our players to be good, to be able to make the most of their opportunities, produce efficiently when they get the ball, earn the ball via being talented. And so the number one thing I look for is talent. Talent obviously isn't the only thing, and really maybe the most important data point we look for is potential opportunity. And so what does the what does the depth chart on this player's team look like? What does the pass run ratio look like? You know, what sort of situations is this player going to be involved in vis-a-vis -vis their talent on the field? What does their talent allow them to do opportunity-wise as far as like, you know, are they going to be on the field on third downs? Are they going to get the ball in first and second? down? Are they going to be on the field in short yard situations? Things like that. So talent and opportunity are very much intertwined and they are also intertwined, at least opportunity is, with a player's situation. And that would be, you know, the off of the offensive environment in which he operates, the team he's on, um, surrounding skill position talent, offensive line talent, quarterback play, play calling tendencies, all of those things contribute to a player's situation and where situation and opportunity converge and talent and opportunity converge. Then we have fantasy outlook and so I'm going to go through each of those three things in order to dissect this sort of Brees Hall conundrum of what we can expect in year one. And number one is his talent. And obviously he was selected as the RB1 in this rookie class. He's, in my opinion, you know, approximately like a, a Cam Akers level talent. Um, I don't view him as like an Ezekiel Elliott or Saquon Barkley or Jonathan Taylor level guy. Um, but he's obviously not like a, a Bishop Sankey or like a Jeremy Hill level dude. I think he's somewhere in between. He's like a Cam Akers level talent to me. He's big, 220 pounds. He's athletic, obviously sub 4'4 speed. He was very productive at a power five school from the moment he stepped on campus as a freshman. But I do think his collegiate profile is a little bit less impressive than his, you know, his speed score and his dominator rating would suggest when you look at him under a microscope. His, his overall efficiency as a runner was really good in the 73rd percentile per box adjusted efficiency rating, um, which measures his like per carry contributions relative to the other guys on the team, given the box counts that he's seeing. So kind of normalized for the situations he's carrying the ball in. That was really high in the 73rd percentile, really impressive. He was an efficient runner overall, but his relative success rate, which instead of per carry efficiency overall looks at efficiency from like a consistency standpoint. So how often is he gaining a requisite amount of yards given down in distance, given the box counts that he's seeing relative to his teammates. So given the situations that he's carrying the ball in, his relative success rate was only in the 45th percentile. And so the disparity between those things paints the picture of a guy who's like pretty boom bust on a per carry basis. Um, I talked to Graham Barfield a while ago, and he shares some of these concerns that that Brees Hall might not be the most like nuanced, instinctive runner at the line of scrimmage that he might be, you know, in college might have been trying to to make too much out of nothing um, in some cases. And so I think there's, there's some growing room for him in this area. And while his athletic abilities allow him to contribute, you know, produce efficiently overall on a down to down level, there's still something lacking here with Brees Hall as a pure runner. Similarly as a receiver, 82 receptions in college is really good on a 67th percentile target share and a 74th percentile catch rate. So he's catching a lot of passes, he's involved in the offense as a receiver, and he's catching a large percentage of the targets thrown his way. All good things, but I don't think he has like exceptional skill as a pass catcher. He was split out wide or in the slot only a 25th percentile amount of the time. So really primarily catching passes just out of the backfield, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it just doesn't speak to like some sort of higher level of pass catching ability that a guy like DeAndre Swift or, you know, he's obviously not a Christian McCaffrey or Alvin Kamara level guy. He's just kind of like, I'm going to line up in the backfield, catch a swing pass. And his average depth of target speaks to that as well. Negative 0.6 was the distance he was throwing the ball on average. So behind the line of scrimmage, so screen passes, you know, check downs to the flat, swing passes to the side, things like that. I think he's like a David Montgomery, Javante Williams level receiver. And we've seen those guys contribute positively, but neither of them are, you know, advanced receiving weapons. They're simply running backs who are functional in the passing game. And I think that's what Brees Hall is. So overall,
overall, I think he's like a talented, athletic dude who was successful in college, um, has athletic gifts that will translate to the NFL, might have some growing pains as a pure runner, and should be functional, though not a super elite guy as a receiver. His opportunity here with the Jets, we'll just kind of have to see, honestly, it's difficult to assess opportunity for rookies. Um, he was the first running back taken, 36th overall in the draft, which speaks well to his talent if you want to evaluate him, you know, as a player vis-a-vis his draft capital, but also to his potential opportunity, because we know, given history and just given common sense, that the highest drafted players typically get the most opportunity to show that they deserve to be on the field early on. Michael Carter is the best incumbent running back with the Jets. You know, he had a really solid rookie season himself, 964 yards from scrimmage, 18.4% dominator rating, which represents the share of total offense that he was able to kind of earn in New York with the Jets. And so if we kind of look at historical trends about like draft capital and surrounding talent and what those things sort of mean for rookie running backs, going back to 2005, the first running back taken in the draft since 2005 joined a team with an incumbent that had an average of 881 yards the year before. Michael Carter had 964 yards the year before, so slightly above average. Um, you know, these things range from, you know, Adrian Peterson played with Chester Taylor, who had, you know, was, was an RB1 level guy in his own right the year before. And then there's, you know, Todd Gurley, Saquon Barkley, Trent Richardson, and then, you know, guys as bad as, you know, CJ Spiller, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Bishop Sankey as rookies, and everything in between, you know, Darren McFad, no Sean Moreno. All of those guys collectively averaged a 25.1% dominator rating as rookies, which just for context um, is about what, you know, DeAndre Swift or Josh Jacobs did last year. So first running back taken since 2005 had approximately like a Josh Jacobs sized share of their respective team's offenses in year one. If we say, okay, we can't really compare Brees Hall. It's not super fair to compare him to the first running back taken because, you know, he was a second round pick. Like Adrian Peterson, Saquon Barkley, Todd Gurley, Zeke. These guys were all like way more highly drafted than, than Brees Hall was. Probably not an apples to apples comparison here. Let's look at running backs taken within five picks of Brees Hall in the NFL draft. And that leaks into the first round a little bit. Obviously he was taken at the 36th pick. That gives us guys, you know, at the, the 31st and the 32nd pick were also first round picks. But I think generally this gives us a decent sample size as well as kind of normalizing things more for where he was actually taken in the draft. So among running backs who were taken within five picks of where Brees Hall went, the average incumbent on their teams had 793 yards the year before they joined the team. And these running backs taken within five picks of Brees Hall averaged a 17.2% dominator rating as rookies. So that's a big step down from the first running back taken averaging a 25% dominator rating to guys taken in Brees Hall's range average 17% dominator rating. And that's like rookie Sony Michelle or rookie J.K. Dobbins range. And this is guys like, you know, Javante Williams, DeAndre Swift, Nick Chubb, Doug Martin, Joseph Adai. So that, that's on the high end. And then we've got guys like, you know, Ronald Jones, TJ Yeldon, Ryan Williams, David Wilson. So like really runs the gamut here of like, total busts through really productive guys as rookies much more than probably the first running back taken does. And I think given kind of like the team situation here, Brees Hall was drafted into a fairly similar situation as guys like Nick Chubb or Josh Jacobs were drafted into in the past where they had like Duke Johnson, Jalen Richard were returning incumbents on the team who were generally pass catching backs, but who had like solid roles, 800 to a thousand yards really the year before. And so a conservative projection in my opinion is that Brees Hall, maybe not a projection, but a, like a characterization of Brees Hall's talent level is that he's, you know, above average for his draft range. Running backs are being drafted later and later as the years go on. He's not the same level of guy, you know, like TJ Yeldon was drafted in the second round, right around where Brees Hall was drafted. Ronald Jones was drafted in the second round, right around where Brees Hall was drafted. He's a better prospect than both of those guys. And so I think he's, he's above average for this, this range of the draft, but I think he's fairly average among guys who were the first running back taken. Like he's not Todd Gurley. He's not a Adrian Peterson. He's not Saquon Barkley. He's not Ezekiel Elliott, but he's better than like Bishop Sankey. He's better. He's probably a better prospect than CJ Spiller. I, I don't know where I'd put him really among this group. I don't think he's, you know, maybe, maybe right around Najee Harris level. He's a Cam Akers level prospect. Like I said before, I'd put him right in the middle of that range of guys who were drafted as the first running back in their drafts. And so what does that mean for like his potential opportunity here? There's no way he gets less than what Michael Carter did last year. Michael Carter last year had like a 57% opportunity share, you know, 52 2 percent snap share, something like that, like not very high. Those were like, you know, outside the top 20 in the league, outside, I think the top 25 in the league. But as far as like dominator rating goes, isn't really a, an opportunity-based stat. 
But given that running backs are so dependent on what the rest of the offense is doing, it's a share stat, you know, like, like a market share stat. And so in some ways it is representative of opportunity with efficiency baked in. But what Carter did last year was have an 18.4% dominator rating. Brees Hall's absolute floor is that. Like there's no way he has less than like a 20% dominator rating. And so let's say just for the sake of projection, for the sake of argument, he gets a completely average for, you know, being the first running back taken in the draft, completely average dominator rating of 25.1%. Take that, shelve it for a second. And so what sort of, moving on to number three, like what sort of situation is Brees Hall in now? You know, last year the Jets were 26th overall in offensive yards, 28th overall in points. And so for the purposes of like my analysis in this video, I'm calling them the 27th best offense in the league. Just the average between their rank in yards and points is 27, 27th ranked offense. And the situation they were operating in was they had a rookie Zach Wilson, a quarterback. They had Michael LaFleur as a first year offensive coordinator. They had receivers, Elijah Moore, Jameson Crowder, Brad Braxton Berrios, Corey Davis, uh, Keelan Cole, all of those guys between 50 and 77 targets. Elijah Moore kind of emerged later in the season, but really they didn't have like a go-to guy who was like consistently playing throughout the year. It was just kind of like a random collection of dudes who all had like roles at various points. And then Elijah Moore eventually emerged. They had Michael Carter, Tevin Coleman, Ty Johnson as the main guys at running back. Carter was fine. Those other guys are kind of whatever, fairly average group of running backs, maybe a little bit below average. And per pro football focus, the 11th ranked offensive line in the league. So a def decent offensive line, meh weapons, rookie quarterback, first year offensive coordinator. There's some growing pains and they just weren't that good. But there is a lot new this season. Presumed growth from Zach Wilson. We have to see it before we believe it, but, you know, kind of expect that to happen. Same thing from Mike LaFleur. You know, it'll be his second season as an offensive coordinator, as a play caller. Second season working with Zach Wilson. That relationship could, should continue to bloom. And then, as for the offensive line, Mekhi Becton was there. I think he was taken as the 11th overall pick in 2021 as an offensive tackle. Missed all of last season with an injury. He should be back this year. And then they added Lake and Tomlinson at offensive guard in free agency. Um, he was the 10th rated offensive guard in the league last season per pro football focus. So those two additions should mean really good things for an offensive line that was already a solid unit. They added CJ Uzama and Jack Conklin at tight end. Those guys are kind of whatever, but it's, you know, it's an improvement over what they had. And they added Garrett, Garrett Wilson at wide receiver who should, you know, kind of with Corey Davis, Braxton Berrios, and Elijah Moore kind of solidify this receiving core. And, you know, Elijah Moore taking steps forward. Corey Davis is just a really solid dude. Braxton Berrios is a solid, you know, slot guy over the middle. Garrett Wilson adds an extra, you know, kind of element of dynamism. Who knows who emerges as the alpha here between like Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson, but the weapons here, the offensive line here are much better than they were last season. A lot depends on Zach Wilson, but I believe this could be a much improved offense going forward. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the deal here. That's, that's the talent level, the, the presumed opportunity and the, you know, kind of anticipated situation for Brees Hall and what kind of do those things all mean together? Like the major question here just kind of boils down to like the opportunity that Brees Hall will have via his talent times the situation equals what? And I think we can gain some insight from that when looking at like RB1 level producers from the past, what their dominator ratings were, what their, what kind of the, the offenses they came from were. And last season, 2021, the 12 RB1s had an average dominator rating of 29.7%. For reference, Joe Mixon was one of those dudes. His dominator rating was 29.5%. The lowest dominator rating among those players was Leonard Fournette with 21.1%. Obviously, he was on a great offense. The threshold for, you know, being on a great offense is a little bit lower. And so he was able to be a, a high-level RB1 with only a 21% dominator rating. And, you know, we generally think, like, we want players on good offenses. And I think usually, you know, in, in general, on aggregate, that kind of that kind of bears itself out. The average offensive rank for these RB1s last season was 13.8. So a little bit above average. Um, Minnesota was the 13th ranked offense. So right around there, like a Vikings level offense is where these guys have come from. And the worst offense that produced an RB1 level guy last season was the Saints with the 24th ranked offense and the Lions had the 23 and a half th ranked offense. Um, so DeAndre Swift and Alvin Kamara both came from poor offenses. But if we go back even further, like since 2017, what kind of offenses have these guys come from? And I, I divided them up into like a couple different categories. Elite, which would be like top five offenses. Good offenses, which would be just top 10. Offenses that are just kind of fine. So 
just like upper half of the league, 11 through 16, below average offenses that ranked 16th through 24th, and then bad offenses that were 24th or worst in the league. And since 2017, we've seen 18% of RB1s come from elite offenses. We've seen 28% of RB1s come from good offenses. We've seen 23% of RB1s come from fine offenses, just kind of in the top half of the league. And since 2017, we've seen 22% of RB1s come from below average offenses and 8% of RB1s come from bad offenses, which means since 2017, 30% of RB1 level producers have come from below average to bad offenses. And so while it is generally true that good offenses are the ones who typically produce, you know, high end fantasy producers at running back, what is that? Like 70% of RB1s come from good offenses, but that still leaves three tenths of RB1 level guys are going to be on bad offenses. And so that's, that's like 3.6 per season. So three to four RB1s per year will come from below average or bad offenses. Last year, that was Nick Chubb. That was Najee Harris. That was DeAndre Swift. That was Alvin Kamara. The year before that was Miles Gaskin, David Montgomery, and James Robinson. Like we've seen this happen in recent years. Going back five years, it happens on a regular basis. Most RB1s will be from good offenses, but many, you know, not most, but many RB1s will be from poor offenses. And so even if the Jets don't improve as a team, there's still potential here for Brees Hall to be a high level producer. And so let's walk through some hypotheticals of like where his production could end up based on, you know, this 25% dominator rating we're working with um, that is average for the first running back taken in the last, you know, 17 years. And then hypotheticals about where this Jets offense could land in 2022. If the Jets offense doesn't improve at all, like Mekhi Becton doesn't matter. Lakin Tomlinson doesn't matter. Zach Wilson doesn't get any better. Garrett Wilson doesn't mean shit. Like if they don't improve at all, Based on a 25% dominator rating, Brees Hall would have 1,300 yards and nine touchdowns over 17 games, giving him 11.9 points per game and an RB27 finish based on last year's stats. If the Jets improve to the 22nd best offense in the league, so still below average, borderline bad offense, they improved a little bit from like 26th and 27th best in the league to 22nd, that would give Brees Hall 1,376 yards, nine touchdowns, 12.3 points per game, which would give him an RB23 finish based on last season's stats. So even if they go from like being really bad to being like sort of bad, there's not much wiggle room here for Brees Hall with a 25% dominator rating to like vault himself into like super fantasy relevance. He'd be a low end RB2 at that point. If they become a completely league average offense, 16th ranked offense in the league, that would give him just under 1,500 yards and 11 touchdowns, which would be 13.8 points per game and the RB20. If they become a top 12 offense, the 12th ranked offense in the league, so it's a huge jump from the 27th ranked offense to the 12th ranked offense, that would give Brees Hall 1,550 yards, 12 touchdowns, 14.5 points per game, which would translate to the RB18 in fantasy in points per game based on 2021 stats. That's not great. You know, even if the Jets vault themselves up to like a borderline top 10 offense, if Brees Hall is producing at like a rookie Josh Jacobs level, a rookie DeAndre Swift level, he has no shot at being an RB1 in fantasy, you know, kind of based on that workload on that quality of team. So let's say we give him a 30% dominator rating. Instead of 25%, we jump him up to 30%. That's the level at which like Najee Harris and Leonard Fournette produced as rookies. So a, a big jump up. And I, sh I should mention that that before with that 25% dominator rating, I'm assuming 20 receptions for the entire year for Brees Hall. Michael Carter's a good pass catcher. I think Brees Hall's functional in that area. That's probably a low ball projection. But with this 30% dominator rating, I'm adding a reception per game. So 37 receptions, an extra point per game on top of what he would have had. And so with this 30% dominator, Dominator rating with 37 receptions over the course of the season with an offense with the Jets that improved not at all. Like again, Becton didn't matter. Tomlinson didn't matter. Garrett Wilson didn't matter. Zach Wilson didn't get any better on an offense that didn't improve at all. This Dominator rating would give him 14.7 points per game, which would make him the RB 17 in fantasy. So this is a little bit more interesting. If he can produce it like a Leonard Fournette, you know, rookie Leonard Fournette level, the Jets don't even need to get better for him to be like a solid RB2. If they improve to being the 22nd best offense in the league, that's 15.2 points per game, RB13. If they become a league average offense, 16th in the league, 17 points per game, RB9. So this is the first point where we enter like RB1 territory, where the Jets are a league average offense and Brees Hall is producing like rookie Najee Harris or rookie Leonard Fournette. He could be the RB9 in fantasy. And if they become like an actively good offense, 12th in the league, 17.8 points per game that would make him the RB7. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Maybe kind of both. I think it's clear that without like a Zeke 
without a Saquon Barkley, without a Todd Gurley level role as a rookie, the Jets need to be close to a top 10 offense for Hall to be like a a high-end RB1. Like, even if they become the 12th best offense in the league, and even if he produces at like a Leonard Fournette level as a rookie, he maxes out as like a mid-level RB1, like a low-end RB1. I just don't think like high-end production is in the cards for him this season, and that's okay, because Brees Hall is currently being drafted as you know, the RB19 in the late fourth round. Like, he doesn't need to be the RB4 in order to make good on his current ADP. High-end RB2 is much more likely, and it has multiple avenues for coming to fruition. Like, let's say he has, like, a 35% dominator rating, which would be very high on a terrible Jets team where Zach Wilson didn't improve, like, at all. That would be an avenue where he could be, like, a high-end RB2, you know, low-end RB1. Or let's say the Jets, like, take big steps forward, but, like, Michael Carter's still heavily involved, and it's just kind of like a 25% dominator rating for Brees Hall. He could still be a high-end RB2 in that situation. I think there's very little risk at his current EDP as the RB19. I think, I don't think that's his floor, but it's pretty dang close to it. There's very little risk there. I don't think the super ceiling is there for Brees Hall in year one, but upside exists at his current cost. Even if it's not like RB3 level upside, it's, you know, low end RB1, high end RB2 level upside with a, a high floor for him on this offense, given his level of talent and given historical trends about what we've seen from highly drafted running backs in the past. Brees Hall is a safe pick at his current ADP with high, though not elite, upside in fantasy football in 2022.